Folks, I know, like I've been in politics for a long time, as you probably picked up from that introduction, and uh, the fact is, is that on the eve of an election, it's very common for politicians to sort of roll up to the mic saying, oh, you know, this is going to be like the most po uh, important election ever. Really, it's a very common thing that we say. Well, my friends, this is the most important <laughs> election ever. <laughs>
nurses to our 16 acute care facilities so that ambulance park time within the next couple of weeks is going to be a thing of the past. We've got ambulances who will come in, drop their patient off, uh, do the patient transfer, clean their equipment and be able to get back out on the road again. In addition, with our, surgery, our reducing of surgeries, we've done two things. Not only have we expanded private uh, sur chartered surgical centers, they're fully embedded in our healthcare system. Uh, no one has to pay out of pocket for those surgeries. We're doing knees and hips and um, and other joints, uh, ophthalmology, uh, ophthalmology. But what we discovered is that there were 39,000 people on our waiting list who were waiting longer than medically recommended. You can imagine that. I think we all know people who were waiting two or three or four years for knee replacements. Well, that's the list that we're going to whitt whittle down. We believe no one should be waiting longer than medically recommended. So we got started, bench, the benchmark was 39,000. And now because we've expanded the uh, surgical capacity, we've also uh, reopened operating rooms in many facilities that were, that were, uh, that were closed uh, down or needed some repair. We've now reduced that already to 30,000 people on the list. So we're reducing it at a rate of 3,000 per month. Dr. John Cowell tells me this time next year, we'll completely have eliminated that list. We'll be the first province in Canada to have nobody on a surgical wait list longer than medically recommended. So the budget builds on the success. It, it, it provides funding for more surgeries and to expand and modernize operating facilities in 15 communities. For example, through budget 2023, we're investing 237 million over three years in the Alberta Surgical Initiative Capital Program, including 120 million in new funding that will allow for additional projects in municipalities across the province, from Tabor to Grand Prairie and from Pincher Creek to Pinoca. This approach will increase surgical capacity and help reduce surgical wait times further. We all know that better care depends on more of our amazing frontline staff and we are investing to expand the ranks. The budget is funding 3,400 more spaces in post-secondary health care programs and 100 additional residencies for newly graduated doctors. Alberta also needs more nurses, so we're broadening our international recruitment campaigns. We're cutting red tape too so that newly arrived nurses and LPNs can get to work right away. This is a matter of streamlining professional registration and helping can candidates through the skills upgrading process. And I know that uh, Deputy Premier Casey Madu, as our skills and our skilled trading professions minister, has been doing great work in, in clearing away some of that red tape. Our transportation and economic corridors department, that's led, of course, by Devin Dreeshin, is also getting resources to people so that goods can move more efficiently. We've set aside more than $2 billion to build and upgrade roads and highways and bridges. Some of this will go to major projects in our big cities, like finishing the Calgary Ring Road, expanding out the Blue Line to the airport, expanding the Edmonton Ring Road, and maintaining funding for LRT projects. And some is for better connections to keep the economy growing, like uh, the replacement for the Vin Vinca Bridge on Highway 38 so it can handle heavy and oversized loads and new interchanges at Cochrane, Leduc, and Balzac. And we're going to continue the twinning of Highway 63 north of Fort McMurray and twinning of Highway 40 south of Grand Prairie. We're also going to twin Highway 11 between Sylvan Lake and Rocky Mountain House and twin Highway, Highway 3 in the south. Schools are getting a lot of attention as well. We're funding education at historic levels, giving school authorities the ability to hire more staff, teachers, bus drivers, education assistants, and to manage class sizes. School authorities can use the money as they see fit because they know what's best for their communities. And funding will help to ensure that school uh, infrastructure keeps up with population growth. This is thanks to a new strategy for project approvals to ensure that schools are built on time and on budget. And cities in line for new and upgraded in schools include Calgary and Edmonton, Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie. We're also looking at a new high school in Raymond, replacement schools in Penhold and Wasetna, and design funding for schools in Brooks and Barhead and more. We're also investing in the post-secondary education system, giving students the right skills to find good jobs. With the help of government funding, McEwen University in Edmonton will get its new building for its School of Business, and Mount Royal University in Calgary is developing a Bachelor of Aviation program, and Northwestern Polytechnic in Grand Prairie is developing a Power Engineering and Instrumentation Lab. But we're not just spending more in critical areas. Uh, our, balance of, our budget is balanced. We have a surplus. We're paying down debt. We're growing the Heritage Savings Trust Fund, and we're putting up guardrails to keep it that way. We've put in place a new fiscal framework that will require all future Alberta governments to balance their annual budgets with certain exceptions and use any surpluses to first pay down debt and save for the future 
before investing in one-time initiatives. And if a government does run a deficit, it will have to balance the books within two years. That's part of how we've structured our fiscal framework. Importantly, we're also tying operating expense increases to the prior year's inflation plus population growth. And this is especially important to control spending and to prevent what could be temporarily high resource revenue from being spent in an unsustainable way. Our fiscal framework means that Albertans can be confident that the funding will be there for the services and programs that they depend on. So the same is true for all communities of all sizes across Alberta. We're, you're looking to the province for stable, predictable investments in services and infrastructure, and we're going to provide exactly that. It's a necessity for the people and businesses already here and for those who are looking to, to Alberta as a place to realize their dream. Notley, in her opening remarks, pitched her visions of a partnership between the provincial government and municipal governments if her party was to win the election on May 29th. During her speech, she talked about working collaboratively with municipalities. And Albertans, frankly, are already asking themselves, what does a better future look like? And who has the plan to get us there? And you know, Folks, I know, like I've been in politics for a long time, as you probably picked up from that introduction. And uh, the fact is, is that on the eve of an election, it's very common for politicians to sort of roll up to the mic saying, oh, you know, this is going to be like the most uh, important election ever. Really, it's a very common thing that we say. Well, my friends, this is the most important <laughs> election ever. <laughs> But I truly believe that. I'm quite serious. And you know, I, I know you all have priorities. Um, and I'm actually very much looking forward to, to uh, hearing about your advocacy even more and, and seeing your involvement during this campaign because municipal issues are Alberta issues. And the fact is, is that you are the heart and the soul of our province. And so you deserve to be heard. In fact, you must be heard. So today I'm going to spend, uh, I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time picking apart politics or the polls or who's resigning from whose cabinet or who was caught on what tape interfering with what criminal process. That was the last panel's job. Uh, today and this morning, what I want to do is talk to you a bit about leadership. And I want to talk to you about our province and our shared challenges and our shared opportunities and my, my party's plan to address them. And I like to think that, you know, fixing problems and finding opportunities is why we all actually go into public service. Some people think it's all TV interviews and speeches, but you know, as well as I do, that it's long nights and it's often very tough decisions. And you do this because you care about your communities. You care when someone comes up to you on the sidewalk or at the, at the luncheon that you're attending and shares with you their concerns. And you know that it's your job to try and to fix it. And even when it might actually be kind of someone else's job to try and fix it. And how many people honestly come up to you with provincial issues as top of mind? Do you tell them now, I'm sorry, go talk to your MLA? No, most of the time you pick up the phone and you call that MLA yourself. And my point here is that you need to know that when you do pick up that phone, that there is somebody on the other end of that phone ready to answer. And that is my commitment to you. So now I'm just going to flip through here and find my space in my notes. Uh, because that is, because the fact is, is that I know that when we work together as two different orders of government who respect one another for the leaders we are, we can do great things. And that's how I view public service. Leadership's not about being the loudest in the room. It's definitely not about being the tallest in the room, <laughs> but it is actually about listening the most closely and acting on what matters. Not only fixing the problems of today, but looking beyond today to see the possibilities and the expectations of tomorrow. Now, like all of you, I'm here to build better communities because community is where people come together in our schools and our rec centers, our workplaces and our hospitals, 
It's swim lessons and basketball games, festivals and barbecues. The places where Albertans show their pride in their cities, in their hamlets, their towns, and their summer villages. The places where we celebrate what it means to be Albertan. And quite honestly, after four years dealing with a healthcare crisis and an affordability crisis, and frankly, a government in crisis, I think it's fair to say that Albertans deserve better. In a lighthearted moment for the Premier, Smith talked about how Alberta has seen an influx of Canadians moving to Alberta over the last four years. She says that it was because of municipalities and due to the endless opportunities that Alberta has to offer these Canadians. In a quite tongue-in-cheek moment, Smith jokingly said that the Alberta is calling ad campaign that was started under her predecessor, Premier Jason Kenney, was getting noticed by other premiers in the Confederation. Large or small municipalities are some of the main drivers of opportunities and securing a strong future for Albertans and all those looking for bigger things. Our population is rising because of our cities and towns and villages and summer villages that you're providing so much opportunity along with importantly, an affordable cost of living, which reminds me, uh, StatsCan, you probably saw, saw recently reported that Alberta once again led the country in net interprovincial migration growth. Some of you may have seen our Alberta's Calling ad campaign. I can tell you, Premier Doug Ford has seen it, and he doesn't like it very much. <laughs> but I think it is working in part, but you know what is really working? People, I don't think, are choosing Alberta because of the ads. They're coming because of the opportunity that's enabled by strong municipalities working with a strong provincial government. Alberta municipalities are magnets for dollars and talent from across Canada and the, around the world. And we have to keep these trends going for the benefit of all Albertans. We have to do this while ensuring that municipalities across Alberta remain fantastic places to live no matter where they are located or how many Albertans call them home. And with that, I would... Notley, while plugging her party's priorities to the crowd, spoke about the team that was running in the upcoming election. She mentioned the candidates who have been or are currently municipally elected leaders. Now, that plan is just the start of our vision for a better future. And I mean every word of it. Now, I've spoken to you collectively here every year and, and uh, many of you uh, individually in one or more meetings over the last while, last few years. And you know me and I, I think you have a good sense of what we stand for. And I can't wait to introduce you to a little bit more of our team, some of whom, you know, you might recognize, like former Sturgeon County Councillor Karen Shaw, who's running in Mournville, St. Albert, or Innisville Councillor Jason Heistead running in Innisville, Sylvan Lake. You may know Bill Tanita, Strathcona County Councillor, and our candidate in Strathcona Sherwood Park. Or Chantel, Sarah Mega McKenzie in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, who served on the Spruce Grove Council there. And who, of course, could forget Calgary Councillor Drew Farrell. She's running in bow because like all of the folks I just described, she wants to build a better future for her community. And of course, you know, you all know Joe, who's been in this space, well, for 93, 94 years now. <laughs> quite dedicated. And finally, I can't say her name, but we do have one more candidate who's going to be seeking a nomination for our party. And I believe she'll be announcing around noon today, as soon as she concludes her responsibilities here. And I suspect you'll recognize her. She has a deeply impressive record of service to her community and the entire province. She might even be sitting somewhere in the front row right now. Although I'm looking, and when we planned this, turns out she's not actually there right now, but that's okay. I can't let the cat out of the bag right now quite yet anyway, but do stay tuned. Overall, our team is in it for the right reasons. These folks want to keep serving the public by being focused on what matters. Good jobs, better health care, and a lower cost of living. Now, the person whom Rachel Notley was talking about there is Vegreville Councillor Tanine Rudick. Councillor Rudick stepped down as president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities on Friday, moments before her announcement. Rudick will be running in the riding of Fort Saskatchewan Vegreville if she wins the nomination. Now, the introductions and niceties weren't all about the provincial leaders. Municipal leaders from across the province were able to ask questions about issues that their communities were facing and get answers on how the two major parties would handle said issues. 
One notable exchange came from the mayor of Lloyd Minster, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Canada's only border city. Mayor Gerald Albers asked Premier Daniel Smith about the infrastructure funding and needing to work with municipalities who maintain over 60% of the provincial infrastructure in the province. Now, this is a long clip. And I want to play it in its entirety because the issue of infrastructure has been coming up a lot over the last few months as I speak to councillors and mayors from across Canada and Alberta. Thank you very much, Premier Smith, for being here. Mayor Gerald Albers, City of Lloydminster, Alberta, Saskatchewan. Premier, you talked about economic growth, and that's very important in the province of Alberta. You talked about infrastructure at the provincial level, very important to support that economic growth. I'd just like to remind you that we maintain 60% of the infrastructure that supports your infrastructure and brings business to Alberta. And we would ask the government of Alberta to remember municipalities, water, sewer, recreation and cultural facilities, roads, because without the backbone of Alberta, people will not move here. It doesn't matter if it's Calgary, Edmonton, high level, foremost, whichever part of the part of the province. So I would ask that future budgets, I know you've made commitments in this budget, but we'd ask you to consider how important our infrastructure is to support your infrastructure. 100%. Thank you. So there's a few things I'd say about this. We, we, we certainly will have to do a major investment in water and sewer infrastructure. And I, I saw this firsthand in High River during the floods in 2013 and all of the repair work that had to be done afterwards and the expense associated with that. And all of the communities in this similar area have similar age infrastructure, things built out in the 50s and 60s. And so I'm, I'm very aware of how much more at ease I am in High River, knowing that all of this work has been done. And I know that, it, that it's, it's just gonna be too expensive a burden for the municipalities to have alone. So we've begun the process of expanding out, I think we're calling it again, Water for Life, uh, that, that program. But I, I think just know that I recognize that this is such a huge infrastructure piece, especially for the smaller communities that we will have to find some solution to be able to help bridge that gap. On the issue of recreation and cultural facilities, you're 100% right. And I'll just say, from my perspective, um, I, I thought that Peter Lougheed's vision for our province was the right one. Um, if you look at the other provinces, most of them, like look at British Columbia, right? So their major centers are Victoria, Vancouver. In, uh, in Saskatchewan, you've got two centers, large ones, Regina and Saskatoon. In Manitoba, all roads lead to Winnipeg. <laughs> and in, uh, in Ontario, I think there's five major centers. Look what we have in Alberta. We've got Calgary, Edmonton, Red Deer. We've got Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, and uh, this huge economic driver over in Lloydminster and Cold Lake. You, you get a little bit of help because a lot of your uh, support also comes from Saskatchewan. So I might, might, might defer some of your questions to, <laughs> to Premier Scott Moe. But, but the point is that the, the, the reason why law he built out our regional airport system and built schools and hospitals and, um, and, and infrastructures, he wanted people to be able to to live anywhere in this province. And when you look at our, the advantage that we have in, in having the affordability message that we're able to send to the world, it's because there's so many incredible, vibrant, robust communities to move to with all of the things that you're talking about. So cultural and recreation is vitally important because people like to live and work and do the recreational activities in their home community. And if you can, if you wanna do job attract, attraction, you have to have family attraction. And when you've got families, you need to have good schools, you need to have, need to have things for the kids to do. And then grandma and grandpa want to move there to be near the grandkids. So you need to have good health care services so that they feel confident if they get sick. And then they want to age in place. So you've got to have the lodges and the, the long-term care facilities. So I look at that as being essential, that in each of our major economic hubs, we should make sure sure that people are able to to have as many services as possible close to home we're starting that for sure from what you can tell with healthcare. but uh, i i have a, a strong commitment to making sure that uh, that when people look at our province they are looking at at it at have, as having what 326 different municipalities that they can live in that they're all vibrant all robust all excellent places to live and anything we can do to help support you in that aspiration we're here for you we have a room full of people here to help you. You just need to reach out to us. We're here for you. Done.
During the question and answer session with Rachel Notley, Grand Prairie Councilor Drew Bressy asked Rachel Notley if she believed there was a fiscal imbalance between the two levels of government. Again, we've been hearing about this issue a lot over the last two years. So we want to play the entire answer from Ms. Notley. Do you believe there's a fiscal imbalance between municipalities and the provincial government? And if so, how do you plan to rectify that? Uh, you know, I think that uh, what they're, you know, the relationship between um, provincial government and municipal governments and their fiscal relationship depends very much in terms of whether the province is is filling its responsibilities and doing the things that it's intended to do or whether they're downloading. So it's not just a fiscal discussion. It's also a program discussion in terms of what things the province is doing. And so uh, we have to look at all uh, together. Uh, in our Partners in Prosperity uh, paper that I mentioned, albertasfuture.ca, thank you, thank you, thank you there, audience, um, uh, you will see that, that we have a number of, of principles that are outlined there in terms of the fiscal relationship that we want to build uh, with, the, with municipalities. And part of it, of course, is ensuring that we share in uh, the good times and the bad. And part of it is in ensuring that we uh, provide predictability and stability and part of it is making sure that, as I said today, that Alberta is, uh, serves as a, as a good partner, that the province serves as a partner to municipal government so that we're not in a situation where municipalities are forced to scramble to backfill um, uh, services that the provincial government isn't providing. You know, And there's lots of examples of that. I touched on some of them, but not all of them. Um, so I, I feel that it is an ongoing relationship and an ongoing uh, conversation that we always need to be having about how we uh, address the, the needs that are, that are facing our citizens. Thank you. While the party leaders were there pitching their vision for the province and their visions for the relationships between the two levels of government, business was also at hand for the Alberta municipalities. President Kathy Heron, in her president's address, spoke about the recent announcement from the federal government that the RCMP retroactive pay would be downloaded onto municipalities from across Canada. As this is an impact that is affecting a lot of municipalities in Alberta and the topic of a provincial police force is going to be discussed a lot during the next provincial election, I want to play the entire speech here. Heron says FCM is suggesting municipalities not pay the bills right now as FCM and Alberta municipalities work through the process. She also expressed concern with the next round of collective bargaining with the RCMP and the federal government, which will be starting as of this conference, March 31st, 2023. I want to talk a little bit about RCMP as well. So we heard a number of updates yesterday from our, uh, from our RCMP and, of course, Tanine Rudick from FCM. So I just wanted to let you know where we are as an organization on a few of these issues. You may recall last summer, the federal government and the RCMP union reached a six-year agreement that included a significant salary increase to RCMP uh, and, and retroactive payback to April 1st of 2017. Our association, FCM, and the and Canadian municipal associations have requested that the federal government absorb these retroactive costs. And unfortunately, we learned with the recent release of the federal budget that the feds will not be covering these costs. This will have an immediate impact on our members who contract the RCMP as their municipal police service. The federal government has advised that they will be sending out letters of notification as well as the invoice for amounts owing this week, and I've heard that some have already received their bills. Uh, probably earlier this year, I had advised everyone to not play those invoices. And I just spoke with Tanine, and she is encouraging all of us to express um, concerned with the download, of course, in your media and to your MP. And she's saying, let's wait a little bit longer before we start paying these bills. We do have two years. That's until March 31st of 25 to pay these invoices. FCM has issued a statement expressing their disappointment with the decision. And they also convened a meeting of all the provincial and territorial association presidents and staff just this morning to work on our, um, our advocacy. We'll let you know as soon as if anything changes as a result of the meeting, and our association will have a press release out probably sometime this week. 
If you're a municipality under 5,000 and receive policing services from the RCMP through the Provincial Police Service Agreement, your cost will remain the same as established under the police funding model brought in in 2020. However, this model expires next year and we're not sure what the new model will look like. The province has indicated that we'll be, they will be beginning an engagement session on the new model this year. So we can look forward to ongoing discussions on policing costs. I know it's a favorite topic for all of us especially a few of my board members. Another key update is that the current collective agreement expires today. Negotiations on a new contract are underway. And while the Treasury Board of Canada has advised that the financial impacts from this new contract are expected to be minimal compared to the previous agreement, they have not shared any estimates to date. Alberta municipalities, along with other contract partners and stakeholders, have repeatedly raised concerns to the federal government about the lack of consultation during negotiations for the first round. We've emphasized the need for early and ongoing communications throughout the bargaining pro process to support contract partners and their ability to budget accordingly and ensure their jurisdictional needs are considered. We have specifically requested that the Treasury Board of Canada provide accurate and timely information on estimate costs impact directly to RCMP contract partners. The federal government and the NPF released joint statements on bargaining priorities and process updates. We are committed to sharing updates with you as we receive them. When it came to slicing up the pie of the new LGFF funding, Heron doesn't hold back saying that she hopes to inform municipalities later this spring and before the summer how much of the pie municipalities would be getting. As mentioned during the RFD session yesterday, we were pleased to see Budget 2023 commit to removing a 50% cap on the growth of the LGFF funding pot. That was a huge win for, I think, both RMA and Alberta municipalities. However, we continue to advocate for increased starting amount. On a per capita basis, the total provincial capital funding for municipalities has been on a downward trend for many years. The current plan for LGFF means municipalities will receive 33% less infrastructure funding than the historical 12 year average under MSI. I know you are waiting to learn what your own LGF allocation will be, I can tell you that Paul McLaughlin and myself and our staffs met with Rebecca Schultz just Wednesday afternoon. We will, we will try to come to an agreement and Rebecca has agreed to be in the room with us as we uh, tell our stories and try to fight for what we think is right. I honestly believe that our allocation formula was principle based, it was sound and it was fair and I will be fighting to keep that at front of mind for the minister. So please stay tuned to the weekly and our social media as we will share any updates we receive. I can tell you one thing, I do not want to spend the entire summer negotiating with RMA on LGFF allocation like I did last year. I want this done. The one silver lining for Alberta municipalities was when Alberta Minister of Municipal Affairs Rebecca Schultz announced via ministerial order that grant funding allocations would now be tied to population growth as per Alberta municipalities' request. Now, the best way for our government to make good decisions is, of course, to listen to Albertans, to gather their perspectives, and Alberta Municipalities continues to be a great forum for that. We heard a number of you ask to return to using municipal population counts for the purposes of provincial grants. This approach does make sense. It helps us address accuracy for grants and also things like shadow populations. So I've signed a ministerial order that will reinstate the Municipal Census Regulation Manual, which will once again be available on the website. My department will use that information that you provide us to develop municipal affairs population lists, which will once again be used in determining your grant allocations. So thank you for your feedback on that. Now, while the conference was mixed with advocacy and speeches, the real work now begins for Alberta municipalities and the RMA. As we head into the next general election, I want to announce this. Over the course of the next eight weeks, the Cross Border Interviews has some exciting specials coming up. We are pleased to announce that our first special, which will be airing on April 14th, will be dedicated to Northern Rural Alberta and the issues facing communities in the North. While the focus of this election will be on urban centers, we can't forget about the people who live in the communities outside of the urban cities. 
we'll be sitting down with three Reeves, potentially four, to discuss what they want to hear from these provincial leaders and how their communities will be advocating for more provincial supports. Then a week later, we'll be sitting down with former municipal affairs ministers in Alberta to discuss the issues that are facing municipalities and how municipalities can advocate and lobby the provincial government during an election and post-election. We are pleased to be welcoming three different municipal affairs ministers to the show on April 21st, 2023. Now, those are just the first two specials, and we will be releasing more over the next uh, coming weeks and months as we head into the May 29th provincial election. So be sure to hit that subscribe button via YouTube and stay informed as we continue to focus on the issues that are affecting municipalities across Canada and here in Alberta. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. I've been your host, Christopher Brown. And remember, just keep talking. <laughs>